Well, he has a blog. You might have heard of it, Faringula. Any <laughs> he also doesn't like crackers. <laughs> and he is a professor at the University of Minnesota, Morris, and rides dinosaurs in his spare time. See, all this, all this tinkering is supposed to go on behind the scenes, and here I am. Smoke and mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> Do your belly dance while I'm well, This is why I don't like you. <laughs> you I, I don't belly dance. I don't know what he's talking about. Is this because I made you iron a shirt for the photo shoot? Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> At least you were wearing a pirate hat. Yes, we did this photo shoot, and she made me keep my clothes on. <laughs> so now you see, you can, you, you've got a reason you can still buy the calendar next year. It's okay. No, I thought you got naked because I was holding that, the, the big light thing in front of me so I couldn't see anything, and you were telling me, I'm was, taking we, off my we, pants. We lied, we lied, we lied. <laughs> we always lie to you, so. Get off my stage, I got work to do. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's a real honor to be here to once again be the opening act for Rebecca Watson. <laughs> I'm supposed to warm the crowd up for her and then she comes on and, and, and she's going to look spectacular. Uh, oh, thank you. The other thing I have to mention is, uh, you, you may not know this, but there is a, a long tradition, a whole two years I guess, of, of competition between Richard Carrier, Rebecca, Rebecca Watson, and myself in the uh, drinking afterwards. It's not really a competition. I win every time. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's why they have made me the referee this year. And I'm, I'm supposed to mention to you that out there on the table after this talk, you can buy buttons and pick your team, team Rebecca, team Carrier or referee Myers, and I, all, I know which ones you're all going to buy, which is going to be great. Um, the other thing I got to talk about is, is oh, I'm supposed to talk about things, right? Um, and I'm going to disappoint you a little bit. I understand this is now supposed to be atheist con, <laughs> and I'm kind of the big fat atheist that everybody thinks of. Uh, and I'm actually going to be doing a talk on science education. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm disappointing all the haters out there that, that DJ talked about. And, and I feel sad about that. Um, so I did, uh, I did add a little bit at the end that they'll hate even more. Because uh, just to give you a little, a little warning ahead of time, I found God. And I'm going to show them to you at the end of this talk. <laughs> the anticipation is building. OK. <laughs> anyway, so that, that, that's me, the guy riding the dinosaur. I'm a professor of biology at the University of Minnesota Morris. I have that blog up there. I have an email address. If you want to harass me, that's fine, because I get so much email, I throw most of it away anyway. So feel free to, to write to me. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, it's, it's, a, it's a little issue we have with this whole business of this thing called evolution and teaching evolution. And uh, it's probably not a problem in Missouri, right? <laughs> yeah. Other states are less enlightened, and we do have a little problem with this. And we get lots of students who, who don't really grasp the concepts and who are, who are taught it poorly. And so one of the things I do for a living is sit around and try and think, how am I going to hammer this crap into their heads and make them realize what we're talking about? And so one of the things I do is, is I, I try to think of pedagogical things. How can I, how can I teach evolution in an interesting way? And 99% uh, of the time, I fail, and it's a boring way. And that, you know, that's the way science works. And I'm going to be doing a little experiment with you tonight, and I'm going to be trying a little a little trick to talk about basic principles of evolution and see if this works. Uh, what I want to do is I want to, I want to play a game with analogies. Analogies are great. They're a really useful tool for working this kind of stuff out. And, and the analogy I'm going to try, and we'll see if it, it, it may fail spectacularly, 
is I'm going to argue that like life, genetics, and evolution are like a poker game. And I've even brought a deck of cards to illustrate this as we go along. We'll see if, we'll see if this works. Uh, why is this appealing? Well, there, there's a couple of really good reasons why I find this appealing. And one is uh, a deck of cards is, is symbolic. It's, it's a symbol of, of chance and variation. That when you look at a deck of cards, you see a lot of potential for variation. So I, I kind of like that. When we're talking about evolution, that's what we have to talk about a lot is, is chance. The other thing about them is, is uh, combinatorial things. Combinatrix is really important in evolution. It, it's, not, it's not simply a, a linear game that what you're doing is you're, you're looking at arrangements of things, arrangements of genes and how they function together. Uh, so that's appealing too. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I'm talking about evolution and natural selection, and uh, it's a game with winners and losers. So poker is kind of useful that way because you can make half the class lose. They learn something from that. And there's another sort of meta analogy here, something that I think is really essential is uh, everybody understands poker just like everybody thinks they understand evolution. Okay, that's a subtle one. You really want to play poker with somebody who is proud about understanding poker because you'll come home richer, right? And it's the same way with evolution. Evolution is a fairly complex and subtle subject. And a lot of people think they understand it. Uh, you know, we had these creationists outside the other day, and I, I went out there and talked to them a bit and tried to get them to explain evolution to me. And what they explain in terms of evolution is ludicrous. It's, it's embarrassing how bad their versions of, of evolution are. Uh, in particular, all you got to do is go to Ray Comfort's blog and look. <laughs> oh, man, it's, I, I do that just for hilarity's sake now and then. Okay, on the other hand, uh, this is an analogy, and when I played with this idea, you know, I, I started realizing there's a lot of problems with it as well, and so I said to myself, no, uh, life, genetics, and evolution are not like a poker game. We're going to see very quickly that it has a lot of deficiencies. And, and why is that? Why does it have all these problems? Well, it's because it's a freaking analogy, people. <laughs> Analogies are not the same as the real thing. This is something we always struggle with, too. Even at the higher levels of, of biology, there are a lot of concepts that float around that drive us nuts because people take them too literally. Uh, any of you who are evolutionary biologists know about things like adaptive landscapes? Adaptive landscapes are something we use all the time in teaching higher level uh, understandings of genetics, and they're completely false. They really mislead people. But I won't get into that. I'm going to just talk about the simple stuff this time. Uh, and of course, the other thing about analogies is that as, as we get more and more specific, the analogies tend to fall apart. And if we cling hopelessly to the analogy, um, it gets worse and worse and worse. And we can actually confuse students more. So one of the things I want to get across here is I'm, I'm going to make some analogies with a card game. And I think where the analogies fail are sometimes also very instructive. They're also useful for teaching evolution, as long as we're aware of them, as long as we don't try and persist and say, oh, well, it's still just like a poker game. It's not. So what I'm, the, what I'm actually doing today, and, and I'm getting it both ways here, life, evolution, and genetics are and are not like a poker game. I dare anyone to disagree with me. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna play this, this little game and uh, the, the first thing I need is a volunteer from the audience. How come everybody doesn't have their hands up? <laughs> I want more volunteers. I'm, I'm only gonna pick one of you, but I wanna see more of you disappoint, disappointed. <laughs> okay, you right there. Purple shirt, yes. You'll do. Come on up. Oh, wait, actually. You tell I'm Irish, but very red. <laughs> it's okay. So, the first thing we have to do is James Randy's here, so I'm going to ask him to shuffle the deck. <laughs> don't stack it, don't make it not. Would I do that? Yes, you would. <laughs> Okay. 
It's, it's a pretty stiff, it's, it's a very good deck. It's actually a deck I bought in the Galapagos Islands. Well. <laughs> so you know it's gotta be good for teaching evolution. <laughs> if nothing else, you can look at the pretty pictures of the Galapagos wildlife on there. Okay. That's close enough. Okay. That's close enough, good enough, okay. One second. <laughs> any more? No, 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 that's it. Are there any aces left in the deck? Okay. You'll see. Okay. Come on, this, this won't take long. We're just going to play one quick hand of poker, and you'll see. Oh, you don't know how to play poker. Not a worry. Okay. I'm not very, I'm not very good at it either. Okay, so here, here's, a, here's the idea. Is think of a, a deck of cards as like a genome. That here, here's a set of genes. And in poker, you know, this isn't exactly a good place to deal out cards. But okay, so what I'm going to have to do is, is, well, first of all, she said she didn't know how to play poker. You know, we're just, we're just going to play a simple game. You're going to get five cards. You want to beat me. And there's the rankings. No help, right? Yes, and, and Randy stacked it so you're going to get the royal flush or something. <laughs> okay, so what I have to do is I have to deal out the cards. Um, so you're going to have to be patient for a moment. We'll, we'll just do five, okay? That's the traditional, that, those are your cards, you can, you can take those. Okay, so you all know how to play poker, right? It's, it's simple, we're, and we're gonna do an even simpler version. That, that what we do here is we've got the five cards and we have to get the best hand. So that's one thing, is we're gonna get a good hand, and also another good thing, uh, the hand she was dealt was a product of chance, barring any weird manipulations that Randy did when I gave him the deck of cards. So we've, we've got this, this deck. Uh, the other part of this is, it's a gambling game, right? So we have to have some stakes. Okay, I'll, I'll, I, I'll provide the stakes. So uh, what, I, what, I, what I have here is I found this half-eaten bag of spicy nuts <laughs> that I bought in Mexico City last week and I found crumpled in the bottom of my luggage this morning. Is this a good prize? Okay, so whoever wins this hand will win this great prize. Now, maybe it doesn't sound like much to you, but think, if, if we were a pair of squirrels up here, and we were racing across the lawn to get at this prize. You know, that, that's what this represents, is, the, is that kind of, of winning. Of course, there could also be higher stakes. We could say, you know, for instance, if I win this hand, I get to kill and eat you. <laughs> yes, that, that, that's one possibility. Uh, another thing is, you know, if you win the hand, then I would have to submit and uh, have sex with you. <laughs> the point is, there's, there's, there's lots of different variations on the, on the stakes. And of course, by the way, that last joke, if you're doing this in a classroom, don't use it. <laughs> Not good. Okay, so we're going to do this a simple way, and we're just going to say, okay, uh, who wins? And we're not, going to, we're not going to do any of that fancy draw stuff. We just have to look at our cards and see who's got the best hand. How do you know? You peaked. What, what, kind, what do you got? I have no idea. What has she got? She's got, got a, an ace. She's got, uh, so she's got a crap hand, but she's got <laughs> ace high. And I also have a crap hand and uh, nine high. You win. So I, will, I, I will give you my hotel room number right after this. <laughs> you can just give me the key now. But <laughs> yeah. OK, but you get the point. As, um, don't worry, I won't, we'll, we'll do the sex thing later. <laughs> anyway. Not in front of all these people. No. So anyway, the point is, notice that there's this, this ranking of hands up there, right? Uh, did I have to get the royal flush, or did she have to get the royal flush to beat me? No. In evolution, you just have to do better than the other guy, and you win. And so she won. Fair and square, darn it. So the winner only has to be better than the loser. Now there's another part of poker that has analogies to evolution as well, and that is the draw. So in a, in a poker game, you'll also have a, a, a draw phase, 
And that's like mutation. So, you know, we've both got crap hands. And, and traditionally, what she would do here at this point is, you know, before we'd shown everything, uh, she would say, well, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like two cards or three cards or whatever, or, or five cards. These are horrible. And, and so, you know, what we would normally do is she'd say, okay, she wants two cards. I'm going to tell her, no, she can't have them. <laughs> because this is where the differences start to appear. You know, the way you would do this normally is you would pick the card, your worst card, so that you could maximize the, the score of your hand. And that would be poker, but this is evolution. And in evolution, you don't get any choice. There's no intelligence behind this. So if you want cards, you have to do it a really stupid way. We have to pick one randomly. And this is probably a really good card. It just, oh. <laughs> yeah, OK. And then she's. And so th this is like mutation. However, the one, one thing I should mention, uh, what is the frequency of mutations? In, in a sense, it's pretty high. Every single one of you, when you were born, carried roughly 130 new mutations, different from anything your parents had. So be proud. You are all mutants. <laughs> yes. You already knew this, I know. but. Now you know the magnitude of the mutations involved. Uh, so 130, that sounds like a big number, but here's, here's, here's reality. Uh, that's 0.000004% of your genome. So when I let her exchange one card there, that was kind of a hyper mutation. That's overinflated. What I should have had her do is shave off some little shred of one card, and I'd, I'd change a little bit of veneer for her. So that's the magnitude of what we're dealing with in, in, the, in the real game. OK, let's, let's, so she's, she's made this change. Let's see, did you, do you still win? Mm, what was your high? Nine high. I'm still the queen now. You gave me pain. OK, go back to your seat. <laughs> no, take the cards with you. I'm, we, I got to call you back for the sex part later. So hang on to those. <laughs> Okay, so you're, you're in the right mindset, right? We just think of poker as an analog to evolution where you're, you're, you're having these games, you're looking at different genetic sets and you're having a little competition in real life to see who wins and the winner gets, oh, you, you forgot your spice nuts. <laughs> they're really good, but they're kind of old. I, you know. Anyway, the, here's another difference though. Um, and this is a big difference, and this one is, is an important one to get across, is normally in a poker game what you would do is you'd get your cards, you'd play a, a round, and then you'd put the cards down and you'd draw a new set. You'd get dealt a new set of cards. Uh, that doesn't happen in evolution. You get one deck of cards, one hand of cards when you're born, and that's what you are stuck with for the rest of your life. And no, you don't even get to do that draw business. You don't even get to try mutations. You're stuck with it. The only way you're going to get a new hand is by having children, which represents you dealing out a copy of your hand with some few new mutations. And this is, this is often troubling to students. You know, they're, you're used to this idea that you can improve yourself, that here you, ah, here's my hand of cards. I'm going to get some more cards, and they're going to be better. No, you don't get to do that. You're stuck with your genes. Uh, there's an important concept. It's called Weissman's Barrier. And it's just illustrated in cartoon form here. What Weissman's barrier says is that uh, there are two populations of cells. We can divide all of your cells into two populations. One part are the somatic cells. And those are the cells that make up most of your body. And then there are the germ cells. The germ cells are the cells that contribute to the reproductive tissues in your gonads. And that's it. I was actually kind of amused this morning when, when Greta, Greta Christina was talking. Do you, is she here? No. Okay. Well, when Greta was talking, remember that part where she was saying, oh, you know, I, I'm, oh, hi there. <laughs> I have to correct you on something in your talk. You know, she was talking about how she's not going to reproduce, and she's, she feels like she has disappointed her cells. And I noticed her talking to her hand and, and letting her hand know that, no, you've got no chance. And this is true for all of us, unfortunately. Not a single one of our hand cells, anyone in this room, is going to reproduce. They're done. They're doomed. They're damned for all time. They're just going to sit there at the ends of your arms until you die, and then they're going to rot. <laughs> this sounds like an atheist view of life, doesn't it? 
By the way, that's, this, this is ultimately true for every single one of us. We are made of trillions and trillions of cells, and they're not going to do anything reproductively. There's a few little cells in your gonads that aspire to reproduce, and most of them will not. How disappointing, sort of. Now, for instance, I, I, am, a, I am a successful breeder. <laughs> yes, you can applaud, please. <laughs> I've succeeded. I have actually managed to reproduce three times. Oh, wow, yeah. My kids will be so pleased. And what does this mean? Well, this means that this gigantic, lumbering, clumsy body has managed to ejaculate a hole three times in my life. <laughs> and each time, one cell has successfully impregnated another cell in my wife. And that's kind of it. So that's what Weissman's barrier is saying, that all this other stuff, forget it. That's somatic cells. It's going to go on and divide. It's going to make this huge, elaborate creature. Uh, your germ cells are the only ones that are going to reproduce into the second generation or the third generation. And the only mutations that count are the ones in your gonads. So yeah, get your testes irradiated or something. Those are the only mutations that matter. And it sounds very disappointing, but you know, I have a rather more positive way of looking at it. And I'm, I'm going to make another analogy for you. Uh, it's, it's not a card analogy, though. Uh, this is me, OK? <laughs> this is all of us. We are great, big, elaborate, complicated, fancy rockets rising on a pillar of fire shooting out of our butts. Well, OK. <laughs> Analogies break down at a certain point. OK, but we are, we are grand creatures that are doing all this amazing stuff. And we put on a spectacular fireworks show throughout our life. And, and if you look at this from an evolutionary point of view, the entire purpose of this is the teeny tiny little capsule up there that in my case has managed to squirt a grand total of three cells into the next generation. And I know I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my kids. They're great kids. They've done a good job. But really, I do not define my life by those three cells. We shouldn't. That what, when I think of myself, I think of myself as the grand fireworks going off right there that will eventually fall back to Earth. But so what? No, it's, it's the act that's important. And my kids, of course, I'm, like I said, I'm proud of them. Uh, but their job right now is to put on their own rocket show. And that's their thing. OK. So let's get back to poker. And let's think about another thing that, that's very analogous. And I want to talk about this, shuffling and sorting. OK? We're used to this concept in poker. You know, you got this deck of cards, and we cut them, and we shuffle them around, and all this kind of stuff. We're rearranging things. And that's part of this chance element. We try to generate more chance in our deck of cards. And what I want to do is compare that to our genomes. So here's this deck of cards. I, I, like I mentioned earlier, I need three billion cards to represent the entire nucleotide array, but that would be a little bit unwieldy. So we're just using the 52 here. But it's the same principle. Here's this deck of cards, and things get shuffled. When we say they get shuffled, what we're talking about is this, chromosomes. So a quickie lesson in cytology. This is a little cartoon illustrating the chromosome sets you all have. We all have. 23 pairs of chromosomes that are listed up there. They look roughly like this. Uh, what they have on them is these, these strange banding patterns. That's u heterochromatin and euchromatin. It's just this protein that packages up the, the DNA in particular ways. And on those chromosomes are genes. So there's an array of genes here. And human beings have roughly 20,000 genes sprinkled throughout these chromosomes. Now, when I say shuffle and sort, there are ways that these get rearranged. This is, this is the canonical arrangement of chromosomes in a human being. And it's recognizable and it's pretty consistent from one person to the next. Although there are a surprising number of variations in this that we won't get into, but it's really interesting. But anyway, there's all these arrangements, but they can, they can get changed around. So here's an example of things that really commonly happen. 
we know the mechanisms for this, okay? We go into the lab, I go into the lab just about every day when I'm teaching genetics and we play with this and we have cells that, that rearrange themselves and we watch it and do crosses to, to see what's happened. Uh, and what, what you see here is just a very common thing. You've got a chromosome that's got genes A, B, C, D, E on it and what's happened here is in this case you can have either a deletion, so that's like, you know, I lose a card, throw it off the stage, okay? Or a duplication, I have I have a magic power that my deck has. Human beings have this, but you know, real decks don't. Where there are, you can have accidents that actually duplicate a card within your deck. So the number of cards in here is constantly increasing, which is hard to simulate. Okay, I'd have to have a second deck and start inserting things. But anyway, you can have deletions and duplications. The other things that can happen are chromosomal defects like this. Uh, you can actually split your deck in two. So a chromosome can have a, an, an event where it breaks and now all of a sudden you've got two chromosomes in place of one. Uh, we also have events like this one, Robertsonian fusions, where you have two chromosomes and uh, they just get brought back together into a single deck. So that kind of thing can happen all the time. Now the important thing about this is that there's all these random events going on. And you can imagine, you know, here I've got this deck of cards, and if I study this carefully, it has a particular order in it. What I could do, for instance, is if I knew that order, and then I cut the deck and rearrange it that way, if I went back through the deck of cards, I would be able to detect where the cut occurred, and I'd be able to see where the rearrangement took place. So this is reconstructing past decks from, from looking at the sequence. And we can do this. We see this all the time. In particular, we can use this to examine the shuffling that has been going on in lineages related to ours. So I'll show you an example here. Uh, this is a really cool diagram. I should have a pointer. I don't have a pointer. Anyway, uh, what we've got here is a whole bunch of chromosomes. And it's kind of hard to see, but you see how they're in groups of four? So there's chromosome number one up there, and it says underneath it, H-C-G-O. Uh, H means human, C means chimpanzee, G means gorilla, and O means orangutan. We split from orangutans roughly 12 to 16 million years ago. So for 12 or 16 million years, uh, the human race has been cutting their deck, and the orangutans have been cutting their deck. And so what we can do is we can look for differences. There aren't very many. This is the dazzling thing. When you look at other primates and you look at there, uh, what you see is largely most of these arrangements are pretty much the same. You see the banding patterns, they're pretty much identical. There's little differences in, in size. And those represent bits and pieces where a chunk has moved to another chromosome. Uh, one common thing is uh, there's another process you can do uh, called inversion which you can't really do on a deck because they're, they're all, you know, they, they don't matter, but it'd be doing this. It doesn't matter in a deck of cards, but it does matter in a chromosome. You can take a chunk of a chromosome and invert it, and that shows up. So for instance, if you look at uh, chromosome 10, or no, chromosome 11, excuse me, there's a nice inversion in the orangutans that you can, you can detect. So we can shuffle these things around that way. We see this in our closest relatives, in the primates. What do you think would happen if we went to an animal that was more distantly related to us? Oh, before I do that, let me mention one other thing. Uh, look at chromosome two. Chromosome two is pretty cool. Uh, chromosome two, you'll notice uh, humans have one chromosome and all the other apes have two. That's because we are the product of a Robertsonian fusion. There was a fusion event that, that spliced two chromosomes together and we can see that when we look at the structure. So again, seeing history and looking at the organization of chromosomes. Okay, anyway, so here I'm talking about primates. So I said 12 to 16 million years separation. We've shuffled the deck a few times. If we go to something like a mouse, a mouse has been separate from the human lineage for 65 to 85 million years. What would you predict about their chromosomes relative to humans? More shufflings. More shufflings. And we can see that. But the cool thing is we can also see where, where it hasn't shuffled. Okay, so here's, 
Here's a complicated illustration. What this is, is uh, the chromosomes drawn up there are the human chromosome sets. And down there at the bottom, there is a key. And that key is illustrating the color of mouse chromosome. So imagine mouse chromosome one is all gray, as you see from the key down there. When we look for the genes that are present on mouse chromosome one and ask where are they in humans, it's not random. It wasn't, you know, it's like, like in this progression, there hasn't been a lot of shuffling. There's been a number of cuts, okay? And if you cut a deck of cards, what you have is, you know, there's portions of the deck that have the same arrangement relative to the, the arrangement prior to the cut. And what you see there is that mouse chromosome one is present on our chromosome one, a chunk of it, and it's partially on chromosome two and a couple of pieces, and there's a couple of small bits scattered around in there. So what you see there is the evidence of all the cutting that's been going on, this random cutting of the deck of the genome between mouse and humans in the last 65 to 85 million years. And obviously it's much more significant than the amount of rearrangement that went on between different primates. For one thing, you'll notice that, that mice have 20 chromosomes rather than the 23 pairs. So they have just rearranged all their chromosomes, all the stuff on the chromosomes in complicated ways. This is called a synteny map, and we can make all kinds of synteny maps for just about any creature we have molecular information on and splice them together and reconstruct the history. So like I said, gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, they've been 12 to 16 million years separate from us. There's been a number of shuffles there. Uh, when we go to the mouse, it's 65 to 85 million years, and there's been a number of shuffles. Can we keep on doing this? And yes, we can. We can go to fish. So here's fugu, same sort of, that's the, uh, the puffer fish. And it's had the same sort of thing going on, only we've been separated from them for about 450 million years, so a lot longer. And I think you can see even more shuffling has gone on. This, is, this has been a really randomized deck, but we can use that same, so in this case that they've got the human chromosomes color-coded down here, and you can ask where chromosome one in the human is in the fugu, and it's, 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 there's no pattern. It's scattered all over the place. So one point to make here is what's been going on in evolutionary history is God has been shuffling the deck a lot. He's just been sitting there playing cards with our genome. Uh, and most of it doesn't make a big difference. If you look in these organisms, mice have about 20,000 genes, fugu has about 20,000 genes. We've all got the same genes. They've just been juggled around by this, this business. Another thing we learn is there's this idea of common descent. And this is a consequence of that bizarre exception from the rules of poker I mentioned earlier. One life, one hand. That what's been going on is every time you have a child, you are giving them a copy of your hand, okay? The hand you've been dealt. And this has been going on for generation after generation after generation. And what that means is that when you look in a lineage, what you see is a lot of constancy. You know, I, I showed you my, my crap hand here, you know, the, the four, five, six, eight, nine that I had. Oh man, I need a seven. Anyway, anyway, the crap hand I've got here, I have given that to my kids as well. I told you I had three kids, you know, and they ought to be pissed with me. <laughs> and it's true, you know, that there's, there's lots of things we give to our children we, we wish we didn't. You know, my parents, for instance, uh, gave me a predilection for heart disease in middle age, which I'm not too happy about. It got my father. It's probably going to get me at some point. And my kids have probably inherited it. That's what I mean by you sometimes get crap hands in your, in your deck. So, you know, this happens all the time. So this, this is all getting passed on. But at the same time, there's that little rate of mutation. Remember I told you 0.000004% of your genome is, is getting randomized in every generation. So there's this little bit of change. That's a slow change. What it means is that there's a lot of, a lot of conservation in the genome. We saw that shuffling going on just a moment ago. But at the same time, when we look at the genes, we, you know, all these animals I just showed you, we've all got the same genes. We have to go back even deeper to find differences. And I'll just show you an example of these kinds of similarities. Uh, what this is, is is a diagram that illustrates how much similarity there is between our genes, 
and the genes of something very distant from us. We're talking plants and fungi, not chimpanzees. We're going all the way back. We're going back a billion years, 900 million to a billion years of descent. Ask them, what's, what do we find there? And what we find is that when you characterize all the genes in a human and ask how many of them are kind of common to fungi and plants, that little pie chart up there, 80% of our genes are shared with plants. Isn't that impressive? You know, there, Ray Comfort, Banana Man, you know, there's, there's, there's an element of truth there. We do share a lot in common with a banana, 80% of our genes. And if you look at this breakdown further, they, they, they break it down in, in more detailed ways. They've got novel domains, novel pairings. So sometimes you have genes that, that, that stick together in, in novel ways, or genes that have just a little piece that's radically different. And only 15% of our genes are completely novel compared to plants and fungi, okay? Uh, they're still pretty much the same genes that chimpanzees have. We are, really are just like chimpanzees. So we see this pattern of, of similarity, and it illustrated over there is one specific system. Uh, this is just a, a, a set of proteins in the membrane, and, and the green ones are the ones that we have. Uh, this is part of a signal transduction pattern. It's, it's how cells communicate with one another. And the green ones we have uh, in common with plants. So if you open up a plant cell and look at their molecular biology, ask, okay, do they have tailin? Yes, they do. Do they have uh, uh, MAPK? Yes, they do. Do they have CRK? Yes, they do. We can find all these things. And then there's only a few that are unique to animals, things like uh, collagen and FAK and laminin and so forth. So there's only a few genes up there that are unique to us. So all the, this, this 900 to a billion years of evolution has been reworking the same hand over and over again and just getting little bits of it changed step by step. I'll mention one other example. Uh, don't worry about the details. Uh, this, is, this is some marvelous work that was just published from Joe Thornton's lab and he's looking at one specific thing. He's looking at these particular class of proteins. He's asking, okay, let's pick something that's unique to animals and he picked a class of proteins called the nuclear receptors. We love our nuclear receptors. They're unique to animals and they are special in, a, in many ways that matter to all of us. Uh, for instance, nuclear receptors are involved in uh, transmitting testosterone to our cells. They're what makes us boys and girls. So you should be happy with your nuclear receptors. So they're, they're very involved in these very key processes. And we can do this sort, of same, this sort of the same thing I've just been talking about. We can go to a lot of different animals and we can look at their, at their nuclear receptors and we can ask, what is their sequence? How do they differ from one another? Can we reassemble an evolutionary history from them? And again, I would love to go through all the details with you, but we don't have two or three hours, so I would get in the way. Well, yeah, we don't care about Rebecca, <laughs> but, but we don't want me to slow down your progress towards drinking. So I'll just, I'll just summarize. Oh, that gets applause for shame. <laughs> that, that, that here's kind of their summary diagram, where what they've done is they've pieced together all the different nuclear receptors, and they ask, when did they evolve? Where did they come from? And what you see here is, is a complex tree diagram. Uh, coatoflagellates are protists, little one-celled organisms. Demosponges, sponges. Uh, placozoans, those are flatworms. Cnidarians are jellyfish. Uh, protosomes are things like arthropods, and deuterosomes are us. And you can ask, okay, where's all the evolution been going on? And what you see is each of these steps is, for instance, in sponges, they find this one version of nuclear receptor called HNF4. So that's been around for a long, long time. We have it, okay? And it's also in sponges. It's also in every other creature in this diagram except the quinoflagellates. And then if we go up another step, oh, for instance, there's TR2, TR4, or the steroid receptors. That's uh, steroid receptors. They're popular. Let's talk about steroid receptors. Those evolved in animals that were precursors to placozoans and cnidarians, flatworms and jellyfish, and us. So you find these in all of these creatures. Go up another step. Uh, there's TLX, PXR. That evolved in creatures that were, that were the ancestors of jellyfish and us. Then up there, you go farther, there's all oh, the retinoic acid receptor, RAR, for instance, a lot of very important receptors there. Those evolved in the ancestors of insects and us. And then finally, you can see that this last one, HR39, 
Well, we finally got one that's unique to us, okay? But otherwise, we're sharing these with all these other creatures. This is an indication of common descent, that we're all closely related to one another. So we see that. It's, it's another indication of the way we're playing poker here, sticking with our hand for so long and only gradually getting new capabilities added to it. Okay, let me talk about another one. Uh, this one I kind of like because uh, I teach genetics and one of the things I teach about is reaction norms. And who knows what reaction norms are? Oh man, oh, one person. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. It's a really hard concept to get across to students, it turns out. And I think, I think cards actually help. Uh, wild, wild cards are just like reaction norms. And what are reaction norms? To illustrate a specific example, I've shown here uh, a, a very famous picture from a classic paper in the field by uh, Klaus and Keck and Heasy. And what this is illustrating is a plant called Achillea. And Achillea is, is it's a cool plant. It's found in California. And what's illustrated in this little diagram is that you can sample these plants from different places in California, from the coast all the way up into the mountains, so at different elevations. And you can look at these plants and ask what they look like. And for instance, what you can see is kind of a pattern there, that down here in the San Joaquin Valley, where it's nice and lush and wet and, and happy and rich atmospheres and all sorts of things, the plants grow really tall. And if you get up into the higher elevations where it's, it's in the mountains, you find that they're really scrubby. Okay. So we've got this variation that we can see out there. And what Klaus and Kak and Heasy asked is, okay, how much of that is predictable? Do they have a set of genes that predict this sort of thing? And they took advantage of a feature of plants, which is you could take that, you know, you could, for instance, take that plant from San, San Gregorio though, there, the second one, and because it's a plant, you can clone it. We can do this with animals now too, but it's a lot more involved. It's really easy to clone plants. You just take them, you chop them up, and you grow the individual bits and pieces up. And what you do is you grow that, you, you take that and you make multiple clones and then you plant them at those different elevations up there and you ask, what do they do? And that's gonna describe the norms of reaction. And what we mean by that is that put these in a different environment, you get a different result. They grow in different ways. And unfortunately for us, it's a really complicated pattern. So here's what's illustrated. So each of these, vertically each of these is one clone. Okay, so we take plant number one and we make three copies of it. And we plant it at low elevation, medium elevation, and high elevation. And once upon a time people said, well, we could predict that it's, it's adapted to the lowland environment, so it will do really well down there, and it will do horribly up at the high environments, and we'll see a little gradation as you go higher and higher. Uh, but look at it. At low elevations it thrives, as we expected. It does really badly at medium elevations, and then all of a sudden at high elevations it does great. So this is what I mean by norms of reactions, asking how do they respond to particular environments. And when we try and figure out what they're doing, it's impossibly complicated. But I think we can explain it with a deck of cards because you know, there's all these rules for poker. And you could say, for instance, well, over here, whoever gets a hand of cards over here, uh, deuces are wild. And over here, Jacks are wild. And then you can ask, what happens to a hand of cards as you play it? It will vary in very complex and unpredictable ways as you move across the room. It won't be simply linear where, you know, this hand wins every time over there and loses every time over there. What you'll have is a complex pattern depending on, what, oh, I have no jacks or deuces, but I, well, you get the idea. That, that, that wild cards represent variations in the response to the environment. So we can actually model these in the classroom by playing this game. Okay, there's another concept I want to get across. It's really hard to get, get to students, especially college-age students. And they don't believe me when I say this. And a lot of people don't believe me when I say that. This, and that is the problem of sex. Yes, you tell college students that, that sex is a serious problem for evolutionary theory. And they'll say, yes, it is, because I don't get enough of it. But in general, it's, it really is difficult for evolutionary theory. And I'd like, I'd like my partner here to come up and we'll have sex on stage. <laughs> Simulated sex, okay? Sorry to disappoint you. No, no, keep coming, keep coming. You got your big one. Here's the weird thing about sex. It shouldn't work. 
Because here we are, we're sitting here, and we're, we've got our cards, we're playing against each other, and you beat me the last hand, right? She did better, that, she's got a good hand. And what you're doing in sex is you're basically taking half of your cards and sh exchanging them. So here, let's swap three cards here. Again, entirely by chance, and my hand is still crap. <laughs> Here's the thing, why would, why would she be nuts enough to do that with me? Right, I had a bad hand, I lost to her. I'm exactly the wrong person to share cards with, aren't I? Yeah, yeah you, want the, you want the guy with a royal flush. And this is how sex often operates, right? Is that when you're looking for a sex partner, you're looking for the one that's got the good genes because you know that what you're gonna be doing is exchanging those to produce your children. And so if you've got somebody with the, you know, the, the busted straight, like I had, that's a, I was a loser. Man, you're not very smart here at this game. Okay, but now we look, what kind of hand have you got now? I had a queen okay. eye, and then I've got your nine now. Oh. So her hand got a little better. My hand got a little worse. Why the heck would we do this? Why would we waste our time with this kind of silly exchange? Can, can anyone think of an explanation? It's fun. It's fun. Oh, yeah. You hedge your bets, because uh, maybe what's a good hand one day is a good hand the other day. Yes. That's a good answer. That, you know, I just mentioned wild cards and how they value of these cards could vary a lot all over the place. One of the ways you could have sex evolve, it's called the Red Queen Hypothesis. And the way that works is, if I'm in a very uncertain environment, and I have a good hand today, uh, it may be a mistake for me to simply pass on, to clone myself to the next generation, because the environment changes so much that it will be a bad hand tomorrow. And so if I want my children to survive, I should give them a hand with some variation. But I don't want to just randomly mutate it. I just, you know, I, again, I don't want to stick my junk in the microwave oven and <laughs> toast it. Because that, that's randomizing it. What's better is to look for a lovely partner who has good genes and do a partial exchange. You know, exchange some of those, those you know, her hand, her hand is not random, it's been good enough for her to make it this far, and so we do a little exchange and we see if, if that way our progeny, those hands we pass on to the next generation, will hopefully be better able to survive. So variation for the sake of variation. In the case of the Red Queen hypothesis, the argument is that the, the reason we do this is you're guaranteed to be a bad hand in the next generation because we have things like parasites and bacteria and viruses that are out to get us and they adapt to the population and make themselves better able to eat me in this generation. So my hand is doomed next turn. So I pick somebody, swap genes with them so that they confuse the heck out of all the viruses and parasites for the next generation. Okay, very good, I'll take those back. You are an excellent sex partner. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, now the next thing is you know, we've been talking about poker, and there's, there's something about poker we're used to, right? We're, we're sitting around playing as intelligent agents. Poker is a game of smarts. You're all sitting there, dealing out hands, making decisions, and so forth. I've told you earlier that uh, in this version of poker, you don't get to make decisions. We're gonna snatch cards randomly from you, and you're gonna get a random card dealt back to you. Uh, we're, we're going to have sex and just randomly exchange big chunks of our genome. So it's, it's entirely chance driven. Uh, but there's another concept from poker that's around and that's the idea of the dealer. Who is the dealer? Isn't that a big question that all, all you big fat atheists have been asking all this time, right? Yeah, and, uh, well, who is the dealer here? And we want to know, what, what does he do? What kinds of properties does this dealer have? Is there even a dealer? And we can, by studying the molecular biology and genetics of the genome, make some inferences about the nature of whoever dealt this hand to us. There's a number of things we know about genomes, and, and here's one that, that really annoys the creationists. There's nothing that creationists hate more about molecular genetics than the fact that we're mostly junk. You know, 
my partner and I, we had, we had trash hands, right? There was just a few cards that were really good for us. The rest were garbage. You know, if, I, if one of us had been lucky and gotten a pair, that would still mean that three cards sucked. So this is the same situation here. When we look at the genome, to our vast surprise when this was first done, uh, it's mostly junk. And this is just a breakdown of some of it. 20% um, of our genome, remember, 3 billion bases, 20% of that is made up of something called a line reverse transcriptase. That's just diagram down there. What is a line tr reverse transcriptase? What a la line reverse transcriptase is, is, is a protein. It's an enzyme that takes an RNA molecule and copies it into DNA in the genome. Okay. Does anybody know what we use that for? We don't. We don't use reverse transcriptases. They are absolutely useless to us because they're constantly modifying our DNA, and DNA is an archive of information, so it's constantly modifying our DNA. Uh, who uses these reverse transcriptases? Viruses do. This is what viruses love to do. They love to inject themselves into your cells. They inject a little bit of uh, this RNA that makes this protein that then copies their RNA into your DNA and makes you sick and floods the cell with more copies of itself. And what we have in our genome is 20% of our genome are these ancient, ancient relics of viral infections. They have just copied themselves over and over and over and over and over again into our genome. 20%. That's not good design. Okay, there's another one. 13% are these sign sequences. Uh, sign sequences are illustrated down there. They're shorter. They're littler than the line sequences. And what they are is they are parasites on a parasite. A sign sequence has a little nucleotide sequence in it that is recognized by the enzyme produced by lines so that the line enzyme will copy the signs into the genome. See, parasite on a parasite. 13% of our genome is made up of copies of the stuff over and over and over and over and over again. Again, we don't use it for anything. It's not helpful to us. It doesn't produce a protein for us. It's garbage. It's junk DNA. Uh, we also have these uh, retrovirus-like elements, and these are really relics, full relics, not just the enzyme. It's a full relic of a past viral inve infection. It contains uh, a GAG, uh, that's a protein that's used in the coat of the virus. It's got a pol, which is a polymerase. That's the one that makes copies of RNA. And it's got an envelope protein stuck on there. So GAG, pol, and env. And we can find these things scattered throughout our genome. And like it says up there, 8% of our genome is just cluttered up with these frustrated, old, dead copies of viruses doesn't sound very sensible to have that there. And finally, there's these things called transposases, which again copy DNA from one place to another. And those are also similarly things we don't use, but they're there. So we're full of this stuff. It's garbage. How do we know it's junk? Well, there's a couple of ways we know it's junk. And OK, here's a very texty slide. I'm sorry. Uh, but it's got a lot of stuff there. We, we, we know there are good reasons why we know it's junk. Uh, one is when we study this stuff, when we compare a chimpanzee and a human, for instance, what we find is that the coding regions, the actual proteins that we use, they don't change very much because there's so changes selected against it in those. They're conserved. When you look at the junk, there's no selective constraint on them, so they change like mad. There's a huge amount of variation in the junk. Uh, you know, when you, uh, when you gentlemen are, are accused of uh, fathering somebody's child and they give you a paternity test, what do they look at? They don't look at the sequence of your tubulins, and they don't look at the sequence of the significant genes in your body, because those are all the same for everyone with small variants. What they do is they look at the junk, because it's accumulated so much variation. You each have a unique combination of clutter in your genes, in your genome, and it changes rapidly from generation to generation. I'll also add, I mentioned earlier, that you get 130 mutations in each generation. Uh, most of those are in the junk DNA. So the junk is changing very, very rapidly, which tells us it's not very important. We also understand how you make junk. There's things like gene duplications. There's things like, like those retroviral insertions. Uh, those are random. Well, we know how that happens. We know the molecular biology of that inside and out. And we know that there is no intelligence required for this to happen. 
short of the level of intelligence provided by a virus, which is pretty low, okay? Not very smart. Maybe a step above a creationist, but not much. <laughs> we can also do this experimentally. We can, we can pick an experimental animal. We can pick things like mice. We can do things like zebrafish. I've done work on zebrafish with this stuff. We can do fruit flies. And we can go in there and delete bits of the junk or change bits of the junk. And we always find it does absolutely nothing at all. The next generation is just fine. Uh, we can't do these experiments in people yet because people object if we go in and start modifying their baby's DNA. But someday, maybe, we can look at these things and we can see that changing this stuff, making huge changes in the junk, deleting big chunks of the junk, makes no difference to the phenotype, the appearance of the individual. And finally, we can do comparative work. Um, when you look at different organisms, what you find is different quantities of DNA. And most of the variation is in the quantity of junk that they have. And one really good example is fugu. I mentioned that earlier, this cute little fish. Fugu has been studied intensely because it's got a curious phenomenon. Um, it's got a tiny genome. Remember, ours is about 3 billion bases. Theirs is 390 million bases. So it's about the eighth the size of our genome. It's got 20,000 genes, though. It's got the same number of genes that we do. And some, you know, they, when they've been looking a little more carefully, it may have a few more genes than we do, actually. And the way it got small is it got rid of its junk. All that, all that repetitive stuff, less than 15% of their genome is the junk DNA I just described, which in us is roughly 90, 95% of our genome. And yes, they make good sushi still. So apparently you don't need uh, all this junk DNA to make sushi. We know this much. And you don't need this junk DNA to make a fully functional, kind of cute, pudgy little animal like a, a puffer fish. So the, you know, it's again saying this stuff is not that essential. We can get rid of it. So we know a few things about the dealer. So what can we infer about this great dealer? Well, we, we know a couple of things. One is he seems to lack foresight. He hasn't planned things very well. You know, it's, it's not like he's stacking the deck. He's not James Randi. You don't get the job, sorry. <laughs> so the dealer is just doing things randomly as time goes on. When we look at the dealer and what he's doing from generation to generation, remember he had all those conserved proteins as things are the same between us and plants? Uh, what the dealer seems to be mostly concerned with is fidelity of reproduction. This is true of us too, that you know, we don't give birth to cats and dogs, right? Despite what the creationists say. We give birth to other human beings, and that's because whatever causes this reproduction maintains this rough structure of the gene with only those 130 mutations that might occur. Any creativity we see in the genome is entirely a product of chance. So chance variation is sufficient to generate all kinds of novelty. We know this. We can do this. Now, one of the things we can do to generate all kinds of crazy animals, and I do this all the time in the lab, is, is actually throw in mutagens and we get mutants and we get weird forms all the time. So just chance is sufficient to do that. Uh, the other thing, of course, we know is, is he makes lots of mistakes. So there's a level of error that's always occurring. And we also know that he's no more interested in humans than he is in fugu or fr fruit flies or sponges. We're all equivalent. In some ways you could say, oh, maybe he likes fugu better because he's made sure that fugu don't have all that junk DNA in their genomes. So this tells us something about God. So you know, I, I looked through my textbooks and I found him. I identified him. Uh, here's, I don't know, do, do you need to have sunglasses when you see this? <laughs> here's the hand of God. This is a protein called DNA polymerase. This is the enzyme that replicates DNA. And what you see here, uh, the blue part is this, this kind of hand-shaped structure that wraps around a strand of DNA, which is in brown and yellow there. And as the DNA is fed through there, it splits it apart into single strands that you see up there. And there's an enzymatic part that then sits there and replicates, duplicates the bits and pieces of the, of the DNA. This accounts for all the properties we see in life on Earth is this process of replication with error by enzymes like DNA polymerase. So clearly, I think,
I have to say, whoever shouted that out has to buy me a beer afterwards because you stole my punchline. <laughs> So uh, yes, we have, we have found God, his name is DNA polymerase, and he is another manifestation of the flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> Raw men. <laughs> am I getting questions or am I getting... <laughs> Oh, there's a lesson to be learned from that. Okay, I guess we can turn it over to Rebecca. Yeah, we're gonna take a five minute break and then we're gonna okay. come back for Rebecca.